join the military. It's not as if it's a decision between a full ride at Harvard or a modeling career or a book deal or the killing fields. I think it's a little bit too easy to say that. I travel around the country, and particularly in the South and in very conservative areas. I grew up in a very homophobic environment. But some of these kids, they have no other option. They can't just go uh, and have a, a wonderful life. Some of them feel hopeless, and they have not been educated uh, about all of the many options available to them. And when we realize that, then we do find that some of us are quite privileged to be able to show up on TV and to espouse our particular politics. These kids that committed suicide, they certainly didn't know that there were other people that have been through that particular road. And when they hear messages that they cannot do a certain kind of job and that as a stigmatized minority, just like the undocumented uh, immigrants or Muslim Americans or those people who look like Muslim Americans are stigmatized and, and scapegoated in our country. We all know that the military is sometimes the only option for some people. And we all do not think that when we join the military, we're just going to kill people of color. I certainly did not think that as a person of color. And as my mom is an orphan of the war, she certainly told me that your job in the military is not to create havoc, but is to do everything that you can possibly, at least theoretically, to create peace to some extent. And that is, you know, I know this is going to sound like fingernails on the chalkboard to some of your viewers, but war is a force that gives us meaning. War is a force that teaches us lessons of humanity and allows us to realize something about our society and teaches us the lessons that we probably should have learned before we went to war. Mitch Elder Bernstein, Sycamore, your response. Well, when Dan Choi says that war is a force that gives us meaning, I want to know what is the meaning of the U.S. obliterating Iraq, Afghanistan, Pakistan? What is the meaning of soldiers pressing buttons in Nevada in order to destroy entire villages? You know, the meaning is that the U.S. is involved in wars for corporate profit and oil resources. And I've heard, you know, Dan Choi's coming out story, and it's a harrowing tale. And as Queen years, you know, most of us grow up in a world that wants us to die or disappear. And I think we see that with the coverage of the epidemic of teen suicides. So we shouldn't be telling queer teens, oh, when you grow up, you can become part of the same system that's destroying not only your life, but the lives of everyone in the world. We need to be fighting for universal access to basic needs, things like housing and health care and the right to stay in this country or leave if you want to. We need to be fighting for comprehensive sex education, for AIDS health care, for senior care, for safe houses for queer youth to escape abusive families. And the problem with all this attention on the war machine, all this support for, you know, soldiers to serve openly in unjust wars. The problem is that the military is what's taking away the ability to fund everything in this country that would actually benefit you know, the people who need the most. You know, the war budget, if we could just, you know, take half, you know, half the U.S. war budget, we'd be able to have everything that we want in this country, whether it's renewable energy, whether it's, you know, um, housing for everyone, whether it's health care, whether it's food on the table. I mean, we need to get back to a struggle for basic needs. And the struggle to join the military is a struggle for killing. It doesn't matter whether you join the military thinking, I'm going to 
kill someone. When you're part of the U.S. military, you are participating in hideous violence, you know, in a colonial struggle and in the obliteration of the entire world. And I think Juan made a great point about the DREAM Act. I saw that debate, and it was great. And I think it's a similar issue in the fact we should not be propping up unjust systems in order to supposedly be providing access for more people. It doesn't, it doesn't work that way. When we're obliterating the entire world, Dan that's Troy, not helping anyone. It let's, doesn't get your, help. let's get your response. There's certainly a moral argument here. There is a passion behind Matilda's voice that I think uh, we do need to acknowledge comes from a, a level of morality. We don't want to be a part of this war machine for its ethical implications. Right now, the fact of the matter is, Matilda cannot join the military purely on moral grounds. Matilda and others, we are not allowed to serve honestly in the military because of legal grounds. And if we are to make a strong moral argument, an absolutely strong moral argument on its face after Don't Ask, Don't Tell is repealed, and you're allowed to serve, then your argument becomes that much stronger. Then you can say, I have these skills, and I'm not going to be a part of the military. But right now, you understand the argument. It doesn't quite make sense to a lot of people because your inability to serve honestly and with integrity is just a legal default. We're going to have to leave it there. Uh, we'd love people to join in the discussion at facebook.com slash democracy now. Dan Choi, discharged under Don't Ask, Don't Tell, is trying to re-enlist. And Matilda Bernstein Sycamore is an anti-war queer activist and writer. Uh, among her books, So Many Ways to Slate Badly, and her latest collection uh, that she edits, That's Revolting, Queer Strategies for Resisting Assimilation. This is Democracy Now!, democracynow.org, The War and Peace Report. Back on the issue of immigration in a minute.